Hello, my name is Desmus Claudius, and I am very happy to introduce to you uh, a wonderful member of uh, Nova Roma. His name is Lucius Delius Liberalis, Triumvir Capitalis in Sacerdos Liberi. And I'm presenting this to you as part of the Grand Saturnalia Finale of the Ludi Quinvicinalis. And uh, I really hope I said that right. Um, thank you so much for uh, being a part of the interview today. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> well, my first question um, is basically how you became interested in um, ancient Roman history, because that's always a good place to start. Yes. Um, OK. Um, I was born and raised in London, in central London, in fact, uh, very close to the, uh, the British Museum. And I spent a lot of time with my maternal grandparents um, during the holidays, also after school during term time. And my grandfather would take me almost every day um, to the, the museum and just spend hours, sort of leave me to my own devices running around the museum. And we have not a small collection of things Roman at the British Museum. And I think it started there. So around i think six or seven is the earliest i remember perhaps going to the british museum and having arriving and seeing the lions and the steps and this great greco-roman style very imposing building and thinking gosh i want to live there um <laughs> and i practically did for, for a very long time um we live not exactly walking distance in a sense five ten minutes but uh, my grandfather was big on making me walk everywhere. So uh, a 45 minute walk across London to get to the museum on my own as a, as a, as a child uh, in the 90s, early 2000s, while other kids were playing out, playing football and getting into all kinds of mischief. I was in a museum learning about the Assyrians, the Romans, the Greeks, the whatever was around. And it was my interest in Rome was cultivated also from the fact that there are various Roman ruins around London, uh, the city of Londinium. Uh, we learn about it in school. We were a Roman province. Uh, so we, we have to learn about Rome in, from, from the age of five in, in primary school. And then it gets regurgitated in secondary school. So Rome and the history of Rome has always been present. But I should uh, underline that I am actually primarily a Hellenist more so than than uh than anything else and does that have to do also with um seeing ancient greek artifacts in the british museum because of course there are some wonderful roman and greek artifacts i mean some of them the, the greeks even want back well yes um uh, i shan't comment on the elgin marbles but yes obviously the the presence of an abundance of greek uh, materials at the museum um yes again also at school um we learn about the ancient world but my grandfather has a particular interest in the classical world so at home we have untold vhs of bbc documentaries uh, the old hollywood classics the rise and fall of the roman empire um uh, antony and cleopatra ben-hur spartacus i remember watching all of these with my granddad then the books the busts the the various little details um, was very much cultivated all around the same time, the love for the ancient world, not limited to the Greco-Roman world, because every primary school child learns about the pyramids, the pharaohs and the Egyptians. But for me, it didn't just end at school. It continued at home as well, where the interest and the passion for the classical world was very much cultivated. That's amazing. Um, and I know that you've also, um, for instance, do some reenactments, if I'm not mistaken. Um, have, so when did you first buy your, um, or what, when did you buy your first either Greek or Roman clothing and, you know, um, present yourself as such in public? Um, slight correction. I don't actually do reenactment, um, but my reconstructive religious practices are very ceremonious and, and formal. So I, I do my rituals in uh, period clothing. 
uh, reenactment is something I would actually like to get involved in, but for various reasons, it's not the easiest sort of things to get involved in um, when we're discussing uh, historical accuracy and access to materials and roles uh, played. And that stuff, you know, is, is expensive as well. Um, good quality reenactment things. But that isn't something I have been involved in just yet. Uh, whereas regarding the purchase of the toga and the, and the various tunicas, um, I don't remember when I first, I think it was around my birthday a number of years ago, um, we went to uh, Pompeii, uh, a group of friends and I, to celebrate my birthday. And there is a restaurant very close uh, to Pompeii called Calpona. Um, and when you go for the dinners in the evenings, they, they make you dress in togas and uh, they have terracotta cut um, crockery and, and goblets and so on. And I remember um, liking very much the, the, the feel of dining and being in the authentic uh, attire that I went out and got one myself. So that was, uh, I think, about six years ago. But oh, it no, was no, no. It's, uh, it's more of a Greek style tunica. Uh, than it is a Roman one. And in fact, okay. um, during my sacerdos exam, which I performed wearing a tunica and a toga, uh, the pontifex uh, Cornelius Lentulus pointed out that I was dressed in a far more Hellenic style than I was in a Roman. Uh, so that's also one of the reasons I'm not in formal attire tonight, because it's not quite uh, up to scratch for the, the pontifex. Well, I've actually been to um, Pompeii several times, and I think maybe eight or nine times, actually. But I didn't know that they had a dinner in a Roman attire. I definitely will have to remember it next time I go there. Um, yes, well, it's very, the when thing. you come out of the complex, it's just to the right. And they've copied the layout of one of the, um, the dining places in the city itself. And they've just replicated it further down. They have this whole front garden and porch with... Um, pine trees and the, all the herbs they use in the cooking of the meals are grown in the, the front yard. They have a fountain. They do, um, it's archaeology, it's archaeogastronomy and all the recipes are used are period based. And it's, it's a very fun experience, um, a dining experience. And it's not expensive, all things considered. I'll have to uh, remember that. But um, so regarding um, Greek attire, I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the Roman, like Romans in the empire, kind of spoke Greek, and um, well, not well. They actually not only spoke Greek, but you also had, for instance, in um, Naples, which was mm -hmm. a former Greek colony of the Magna Graeca, and they, and I believe they still spoke Greek, even though they were, you know, Naples is pretty f close to Rome. Yes, um, the. The whole of the the south here um, was under Magna Grecia. So, yeah, they were all uh, Greek colonies, Neapolis being one of the main ones. Um, in fact, where I, I used to live in Naples, I don't live in Naples anymore. I've moved into the countryside, into the province of Benevento, uh, which was actually a Samnite, uh, which was Samnite territory, Samnium. But yes, uh, culturally, uh, the southern Italians, even today, are much more... Greek and Grecian than you would imagine. Um, I mean, a lot of the traditional uh, food that is eaten around the holiday periods have direct bloodline cousins in, in Greek gastronomy. Uh, a lot of the local legends here are very similar to some of the Greek traditions. There is also in the south of Italy, in um, the if you, if you look at the boot of the peninsula, the heel is uh is Puglia and just under the under the toe of the boot is uh, is Calabria there are actually uh, that was up until i think the 1970s there was a sizable population of people who still spoke uh an italian greek dialect um that is based scholars are divided either it's based on the doric dialects of magna grecia or it's a descendant of the byzantine greek uh, kine um, but it's spoken now only in nine villages uh, in the south of Italy. And uh, so, and they are fiercely proud of this um, Italian uh, 
dialect situation. And if you speak modern Greek well enough, you are actually able to understand uh, um, relatively easily. Um, strangely, that was that's an unexpected, as they developed independently, you wouldn't imagine that they would be so mutually intelligible. Um, and there is lots of Greekness about uh, the Southern Italian culture. Um, but Magna Grecia was was uh, very multicultural. The Etruscans were in were in Pompeii. This in Benevento is Samnium. Um, in fact, where I live, uh, I live in a small village called San Silvestro, which is um, a frazione. So it's a hamlet connected to the city of Sant'Agata de Goti. And that was actually one of the uh, cities in the territory of Caudium. So one of the members of the Samnite uh, Confederacy. Uh, and Caudium is the most westerly of the Samnite peoples in the south. So they were the ones most exposed to the Greeks, whether it's in trade or war. So there's always been a very, very strong Greek presence here in the south, um, far more than than Rome. My fr my friends here, be... they don't feel Roman. They talk about their ancestors being as the Greeks, the the Samnites, the Etruscans, the Longobards, but well, much less so the Roman. It, it was incorporated into the Roman Empire for many centuries. So yes, it, um, it, in it, fact, it this, this Roman particular area. So this particular area, in fact, was subjugated for Rome by a man called Lucius Cornelius Lentulus. <laughs> I actually discovered that a couple of hours ago. It was in... Uh, wait, let's just check. It was 275 BC, Cornelius Lentulus subjugated Caudium for Rome, and the, the, the line of Cornelius Lentulus took on the name... Um, Caudini uh, oh. for all their descendants which I thought was quite interesting one thing I really do enjoy when I'm in southern Italy is to, to see this distinct artwork I mean if, if you see like a figurine or um, a bronze statue you could not always but normally tell if it's Roman if it's Etruscan, if it's Samnite, same thing as well with like the paintings and this um well, I'm, I'm not sure if the Samnites had a, had a script. I believe so. Um, uh, there, there isn't. The, the the Samnite language is an Oscan Umbrian tongue. So yes, there 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 was an Oscan alphabet. So yes, um, whether or not oh, yeah. they were all literate, I don't know. But there was definitely the alphabet. Yeah. And uh, and for instance, it's also interesting that for instance in uh, Naples it was Greek speaking, but then you go to Pompeii and it's not far away, and it was. I'm under the impression it was predominantly Latin speaking due to the inscriptions. However, um, it was also a colony where veterans, I'm not sure um, if it was Sulla or or which dictator, um, dumped a lot of veterans there. So basically um, it changed from an Oscan to a Roman town. And of course, due to trade, you know, you also had some Greek inscriptions and this and that, but it, it was predominantly Latin, but surrounded by Greek speaking territory. Um, yes, uh, but in fact, the, the history of Pompeii, the city, uh, even up to modern times, because uh, the interesting history of Pompeii doesn't stop with it being uh, covered in ash, uh, is that um, Pompeii was particularly multicultural, even for its time. Uh, it, as you mentioned, it was a very strongly a Latin city surrounded by the Greeks. But uh, the, the the Roman, the Latin city of Pompeii, is came much later than the the Greek city, which was also an Etruscan city. And the, there are it was never a Samnite city, but there were strong cultural connections to the Sam of the Samnites to the, the area of Pompeii. In fact, um, during my studies uh, as, a, as a Camillus, the, a trainee priest, I looked into the cult of Liber at uh, Pompeii because the temple, there is a temple in Pompeii 
that is quite unique in the in the Roman world, where it shows uh, a male character and a female character which have been identified um, in with various different deities. But the academic consensus is that the male figure is Laufir, which uh, would be the the, the Samnite uh, equivalent of Dionysus of Liber. Um, and the female is a deity called Herentash. Herentash is associated with Venus. Um, and the interesting thing is to find a, a cult site that connects Liber and Venus together. Because it's not clear if the temple was was for Liber and the, she's just present on the on the on the artwork. There is a lot of debate about I say a lot, there's probably about four people discussing it, but there's high debate about whether it is for both or just for him. The reason why it's significant is because Pompeii as a city was uh, um, under the patronage of Venus and Mount Vesuvius was under the patronage for, for the Greek people of Dionysus, who is the Greek equivalent of Liber. And this gives us a triad with the city of Herculaneum, which is sacred to Hercules. And you find, looking further into this, that in fact, Liber, Venus, and Heracles was a sort of uh, tri a divine triad that was cultivated by the various uh, administrations because it linked the Etruscans, the, the Romans, the Samnites, the Greeks, it kept the people happy, um, and it was playing on existing cult centers at the time. But this is something you only find uh, in Pompeii, and nowhere else in Magna Grecia are these figures connected. And what about um, those three deities after the fall of the Roman Empire? Were, were, there still, were they still worshipped, or did it pretty much just become Christianized like in Rome and other parts of the uh, Italy. Um, one of the one of the things that is quite common in uh, in I know folk Christianity in, in the countryside in the small villages is these things that perhaps his that the Holy Father wouldn't quite approve of uh, that are quite generally taken as being acceptable practices and many anthropologists and uh, curious people you know researching find that these do go back to. Um, similar practices from under the pagan times in the polytheistic times. Um, in fact, an example of this uh, Christianization of the, the deities after paganism coming up on the 2nd of February, which is uh, something we can talk about a bit later, is, a, is actually a festival, a Christian festival now that is uh, connected to an original cult practice of the goddess uh, Cibele, Magna Mater, and uh, we can talk about that in a bit later, but the point I wanted to make, um, many of the pagan gods uh, were, were assumed in uh, at least um, the popular consensus in the cults of the different saints, and so of course a lot of the cult practices and traditions of the gods often bled over into the expression of popular Christianity in the in the villages, in the towns. Um, and that is particularly true about southern Italy. Um, many of the, the local celebrations for the patron saint have uh, bonfires and the dancing around the bonfires and the burning of things in the bonfires as a propitious act, as an auspicious act. Uh, there are lots of melodies from the, the traditional music that hark back to uh, ancient times it's the the gods lived on in the the different traditions yes that perhaps their stories were forgotten the reasons why certain things happened uh in fact we have a member of Novaroma Autronia Stola who is the uh sacerdos of of Ceres um she found a, a practice that they have in Sicily at, um where they decorate an empty wine bottle uh, with handkerchiefs and jewelry and they put um, sheaves of wheat and grain inside it and they put spices and herbs and it's they do this around the time of a particular saints festival 
and the the priest at the beginning of the celebration announces on the steps that while the saint is traveling through the streets the goddess needs to be inside they recognize that this wine bottle is the goddess demetra so cheres for the romans and there is this practice of they leave the wine bottle out decorated overnight during the night to remember the traditional practices of the pagans respecting the in the daylight under the eyes of the sun the christian tradition so there is a um a symbiotic way of living even today with whether or not the paganness of these practices is accurate or historically genuine it's stayed on in the people's mindset today so yes the gods are continue to be worshiped just perhaps not how the ancients would recognize them now i i've seen some pictures in rome of a um it's rather small but a um a roman temple that was rebuilt and they have a modern so practitioners of the uh roman religion going there uh and I believe the last, like a month or two ago, and, and I saw maybe like maybe 80 people in front of this temple, like in some pictures recently. Are you referring uh, to uh, Pietas, the Associazione Tradizionale Pietas? I'm not sure. And there's a load of uh, people dressed with white, yes, yes. similar looking toga things, and there's a couple of red stripes, and there's a guy in the temple raised up. Um, yeah, this is, is, is the association for Rome, uh, or is it for, for no, all of Italy? That that organization uh, is, I believe, they are registered in Rome, but they um, have this project of opening temples um, to the various gods all over the Italian peninsula. There is a handful in Sicily. There's some up north. There aren't any in this immediate area, but they are. Um, they are a Roman reconstructionist organization, but there is something a little bit more mystic, uh, neoplatonist about them. They're not um, purely CDR in the way that we try to be with uh, Nova Roma. Okay. Do you, do you know of some other people though that um, follow the CDR in the in the Naples area? In the Naples area, well. Pers I have personal friends, uh, but there aren't any organizations uh, or groups of people. Um, the Roman Reconstructionism, the Cultus Deorum Romanorum, is much more popular north of Magna Grecia. Um, there, are there are many more Hellenists down here. Um, there are more Celtic pagans and Norse pagans than there are Roman Reconstructionists here in, um, in Campania. Um, and, and how organized, for instance, are um, the the Hellenic pagans, for instance, there? Uh, um, as organized as Southern Italians are able to organize themselves. <laughs> um, no, there are. So they try their best. <laughs> there, there, there aren't too many um, public associations. There are more intimate groups of Hellenic friends who practice together. Um, Reconstructionism doesn't really have the best of reputations in the, the pagan world and the neo-pagan world. Uh, and there are often connections to the extreme right, or at least in the, in the way that the people think about them. Um, this is often the case with Germanic heathenry in the north of Italy is often connected to uh, distasteful positions, shall we say. Um, in fact, uh, Roman Roman pagan is uh, Roman CDR. There is one group that I know of, the Comunitas Populi Romani, who are they're, they're not restorationists and reconstructionists like Nova Roma. They are reconstructionists on a religious level. But I've never seen them wearing togas. They wear veils when they invoke the gods. Uh, they they live their religion in a in a very pious way. But they're not. Um, they, they don't dress in togas, they don't dress in tunica. Uh, the, and they're one of two groups that I would say are safe CDR groups in Italy, because unfortunately, the main one that comes to mind when you think of uh, CDR in, in, in Italy has unfortunate links to um, an Italian philosopher called Julius um, Evola. Julius Evola and 
Arturo Regini. And because around the time of fascism, there was this reintroduction of Roman ideas and paganism into the cultural mentality as a way of giving a spiritual dimension to the, the fascist movement in a, in a similar way that Hitler did with the Nazis. Um, but it didn't work out because Mussolini signed a contract with the Pope. So that fell to the wayside. But the ideas of Arturo Regini, who I believe he wrote a book called Imperio Pagano, where he was talking about the use of CDR, religious rites and ceremonies, for the Italian uh, state. His ideas inspired Evola, and Evola's ideas created the first modern uh, CDR group in Italy. And they are unfortunately far to the far right than uh, I am comfortable with. They're, they're full on fascists. Um, so a lot of the symbolism, uh, the Roman salute, is a very controversial thing here because they've they've just signed a new law they've just signed a new law specifically connected to the roman the the roman or the fascist salute. i'm not going to call it the roman salute let's call it the fascist salute um because already in italy the promotion of fascism according to the letter of the law is illegal in practice not so much um but the roman salute has been declared a criminal act if it is not part of historic reenactment so if you can establish that you're doing the Roman salute because you're remembering that the fascists used to do it historically, it's all right. But if you're doing it because you're a fascist, not so much. Um, I've been to uh, numerous uh, Roman festivals and reenactments, and I never once have seen anybody do the quote unquote Roman salute. <laughs> um, in fact, I was this came up in a conversation recently with a friend about how uh, to see um, somebody of a dark-skinned persuasion standing ritualistically and doing the Roman salute, which is obviously from the adoratio that we do towards our gods, where you kiss your hand and you extend it towards the... There is a moment where that looks like you're doing the fascist uh, the salute. And um, obviously, I'm aware what the, of the fascist salute, what it looks like. I'm also aware of what the adoratio is, and the two are completely <laughs> separate. Um, not that I'm trying to find an excuse to run around goose stepping around the city doing the fascist salute, but I am big on accuracy. If we're going to take something to, ch to challenge, let's make sure we know what we're talking about. And just to change gears just a little bit, um, recently you have become the Sacerdos Liberi. Um, yes. Can you just explain, for instance, the uh, process that? Uh, that entailed because I know that you do have to do st studies and you have to do your own rituals in mm -hmm. order to be granted that. Yes, um, as um, Aurelius Barbatos explained to you in his interview, uh, um, the the course uh, is the course uh, is followed with. Uh, I did it with Hortensia Faustina. One of the uh, the grand dames of Nova Roma. She'll probably cringe to hear me call her that, but um, that's what she is. Um, and so the course was once a week. We had I think an hour to two hours. All of us um, listening to uh, Hortensia giving us advice based on the reading that we'd done that had been established the previous week. Um, and she she'd go over points of clarification, uh, perhaps giving them uh, further examples of things. And just making sure that we were still uh, keeping up our um, Lararium practice and errors. And so we'd, we'd be going through those, doing reading in our own time and going to her with our questions and points during the actual course. Um, and we covered various chapters in a, at least two books together. And obviously in our own time, we were doing lots of different readings based on our particular deity because we have to obviously have a basic understand more than a basic understanding of uh, Roman religion, so that we can uh, te teach it, guide uh, future cultures and practitioners of our religion. Um, so then, my deity of choice is Liber. So I would spend most of my uh, time looking at the cult of Liber, the the, the, the festivals, cult practices, um, how his cult impacted uh, the cultural landscape 
Um, but it was very much a case of facts, um, learning facts, gestures, definitions, um, practices, rituals, logistics. It was a very much because we are an orthopraxic religion focusing on the correct behavior and the correct action rather than being orthodoxic, focusing on the belief or the thought process. You're welcome to believe or not the existence of the gods. The important thing is that you do the ritual as it's supposed to be done. Um, so there was a lot of that to it. And then the exam process is um, where you are, you're given a, a basic uh, ritual template at the beginning of the course so that we can do our own personal private rituals at home. And you need to adapt that template to um, the deity uh, of, of choice. Um, I think Cornelius Lentulus also included three particular um, sacrifice offerings and um, a prayer for the health and well-being of uh, Tulia Scholastica Augusta, because she is, you know, not doing so well, bless her. Um, and so there was there was that. Uh, then there, once that's been uh, accepted, you then put you film the ritual being performed. Um, and the third part was a series. I think there were twelve questions. Uh, the first ten were well, three or four um, sentences answer uh, definitions of terminology. Um, uh, yeah, definition of terms, explanation of characters in the pantheon, um, the different roles of the different priesthoods. And then the last two questions, I, yeah, the last two questions were um, deity specific. I remember being asked about how do I distinguish between the figure of Bacchus and the figure of Liber. Um, and then I think in the second question, I was asked, um, how would I, as Sacerdos Liberi, um, maintain the cult and its traditions for Nova Roma, and how would I serve, or not serve, wrong word, how would I um, minister and assist cultures in um, worshipping Liber and developing his cult? Because uh, though Liber is one of the less known deities, uh, Bacchus aside, Liber himself, um, he was actually a very important god to the, to the, for the pleb and for the um, the life of the average common man. Very fascinating. I mean, there hasn't been too many um, people that graduated from the Sacerdos program. So, I mean, it, it's very interesting to there's see. There's three of us so far. Yeah. And, and I believe there's a few more studying as well. It's kind of yes. go at your own pace. Yes, so, it is. Um, it is. I also remember, um, I think I was reading that um, you're contemplating building a temple on your farm. Is that accurate? Yes, that is that is accurate. Um, it started off with a much um, more modest ambition of just having a little shrine outside near the near the vine near the near the grape vines. Um, and then that developed into, well, I could have a little shrine, but then, you know, it would be nice, much like what uh, Pietas are doing, a small little shrine set up, perhaps a, a garden shed cut with an arch and some columns and a few steps. Well, if I'm going to put the few steps in, I may as well put a sacrificial altar in front. If I'm going to, and then it's like, well, do you know what? Let's just have a temple complex. Why not? Um, so th it's not going to be quite... It's not going to be anywhere near the scale of what the Corvi are doing in um, in the Ukraine, simply because we don't have the space and I don't have the inclination, honestly. But it's going to be um, uh, pro dedicated to, to Liber, first and foremost, as that is my tutelary deity. But it's... Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to evolve, what it's going to contain, but there will be a sanctuary uh, for Liber. There will be a sacrificial altar outside. Um, there will be uh, an altar to Cheres because, you know, we are agricultors as much as anything else. Um, there will be 
a sacrificial altar to Faunus because I am a goat herd and we have a collection of goats. Um, and goats were sacred animals also to, to Liber. In fact, one of his epithets is uh, the goat slaughterer. His uh, sacrificial animal was the goat because they destroy the, the vine leaves. So there, the, the gods that will have altars at the temple will be intimately connected to the activities of our small domestic homestead. Uh, we have a plethora of olive trees. I think there's about 30 of them. Um, so an altar and sanctuary for Aristeus and Liber, no, Aristeus and um, Apollon. Uh, there will be, um, we're going to get bees and start uh, cultivating honey and wax. So that's going to have a role. Uh, we're going to use the area for the sacred grove with the apple trees that we have. And we're going to try and build it up so that all of the stuff around the temple will be used in the offerings, in the, the decoration, in creating the, the processional way. It's going to be nice and fancy, but it's not going to be anything like the Templum in uh, Bultova. Just out of curiosity, um, what's the process there in Italy? I mean, I, I guess you would have to get you know, permissions and find somebody to construct it and maybe find someone to do a cult statue and an altar and that. So, I mean, is this like a complex I mean, well, this, process this that'll depends. take a few years? I mean, this all depends on the, the final structure because there were, I mean, if you want the big grand temple, the big stately situation, you can't do that without um, the intervention of Pontifex, of, uh, of the Collegium Augurum, because first you need to find out if you can do the thing. Then you need to find out if the gods are on side with you. Then you need to find out where you do it. And for that to happen, the Augur has to come and set up his little templum and sit down and watch the birds move around. And there's all these different things. And he might say no, so then you have to... And so that's one. But then after that, the Pontifex comes in and does something, and then you can... I'm not going for that at all um, because it, it, it would just take forever. Uh, then the step down is not, you don't need the Algur because it's, you're not doing it with the permission of the gods. Uh, you're doing it as an act of devotion. You as a private, sit, uh, you as a private individual uh, doing this uh, structure. That requires less intervention from the various um, authorities. Uh, and then the, the, you, I could just be me, Ains, uh, Lucius Delius Liberalis, put a cult statue, build a little temple, and if you know it's there, you can come and have a sacrifice. If you don't know it's there, you don't know it's there. Um, it all depends on how quickly we want to move forward, how serious a, a project it's going to be, and, and, and permit ourselves. It would be lovely to have a great, uh, great stately temple, but then that would involve, as you said, someone to have to come and, and do measurements and calculations. We would need planning permission. We would need this. We would need that. And bureaucracy in Italy is anything if swift and efficient. So, no. Well, if I'm allowed to make one little suggestion, is that when you do build um, the temple and you have it, inaugurated that uh you invite the public to make a, a grand ceremony out of it so a lot of people um doesn't matter if they're in italy maybe they'll come you know from hungary or germany or even in the u.s could like really you know take part uh in no it. definitely we definitely will because one of the things that we're also using our land for one of the pro one of the many many projects that we have is um some form of uh accommodation and um sort of hospitality, uh, rural tourism uh, set up. So there is going to be uh, space for people to come and stay and to make an event of it. Um, but yes, that's, uh, depending on how how it goes, it will be a, a big thing publicized around Nova Roma and anybody who will listen, or if it's not so, uh, it'll be a bit more intimate. And if you know, you know. Very interesting. I mean, um, it sounds 
It sounds like you're on quite a large farm, at least for non-farmers. I, I guess, you know, there's pretty much, you know, no upper end to like the size of a farm. But I mean, well, no, for yeah. instance, you mentioned... You mentioned like the the thirty olive trees. I mean that that does take up some space because olive trees are separated. You also yes, mentioned yes. goats. I mean, how, how many goats are we talking about on your farm uh, right now? We we have uh, we've just had two new kids were born around the solstice. In fact, there was one that was born on the twenty first. Uh, she was called Eleni, and then one was born on the twenty seventh or a week later, Philomena. So we have two female kids. We have an adult buck, Agreus. We have the two uh, adult females, Orea and Filuthkes. And we have a small male, Sibario. So we have six goats currently. And um, are, are they milked or do they, do they perform some sort of duties? Well, on you the know, they are, they are now that they, the kids have reached, are approaching a month, we can start um, taking the milk. You're supposed to leave for about four to six weeks for the newborn kids to um, get plenty of the milk before you start uh, milking them for personal consumption. But yeah, we're going and, to start uh, doing that very shortly. And you, you also grow your own grapes, right? We have um, a table grape, so not, not for wine purposes, table grape vine just in front of our, of our terrace um, that produces a small amount for food purposes. We have uh, six baby vines down in the in the temple area. Um, it's my partner's mother's family who are the big wine producers currently. We um, we buy the 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 must, which is the stage between pressing and fermentation. We buy the must from a friend of my partner's father, and we then do all the rest with the fermentation and in, in the in the vats and the decantering. So we don't um, produce our own wine at the moment, but that is going to be changing. We 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 ferment the the grape juice of a friend of ours. But, um, is that for sale or is it just for personal use? Personal consumption. Uh, our intentions of m most of the activities and projects of the of the land are primarily for um, sort of self sufficiency eco sustainability uh, situation, not with um, a cap, not with a, an idea of making capital a profit. That will slowly start to change because we will need to. Uh, but primarily, it's for us to have access to decently and humanely sourced meats, dairy products, uh, zero kilometers, fruit and veg, and all the rest of it. I also find it fascinating that um, not only um, are you a contributing member of Nova Roma, but you're also a, a farmer, as, per, perhaps not as you know your, your main uh, occupation or career, but um, it, it, goes back to the fact that ancient there were, like in ancient Rome there was many farmers and it, like agriculture was such a vital part of society which now these like you know there's I don't know maybe let, let's just make up a number like you know one percent of society today are actually does anything to do with agriculture whereas you know in the past it was much more predominant I mean one of the things because I've I was born and raised in London. Then I lived for a year in a small uh, small town, a small city called Bristol. I was back to London. I've lived in Paris. I've lived in um, uh, Aranda de Dueros. That's a small town in the north of Spain. I was in Rome for a small amount. Of, I hate, strangely, I hated living in the city of Rome. I don't know why. Um, and then I was then I was in Naples for four five years, and in all of this time, trying to maintain uh, a form of polytheist or pagan religion in the city is one thing. But when you live a polytheistic and neoclassical lifestyle and you're in the countryside, it makes a whole, uh, it, it provides a whole new um, aspect to it because you do, you start to understand 
certain things. You start to get a feel for certain things and understand why certain deities became so important, why um, it, a number of realities start to make sense. And it's it's actually been very, very um, fruitful and productive, uh, spiritually speaking and um, culturally speaking, living a, a polytheistic, classical lifestyle in the 21st century. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, I mean, it was living in the city. We, for example, the deity that I, one of the deities that I am a, a devotee of is Hecate, and her offerings were traditionally left at the crossroads. Um, you don't always have ready access in the middle of a busy city to a crossroad at night where you can just go leave an offering and walk away, not being concerned that foxes, dogs, nosy neighbor, rubbish men, someone's going to come and take the offering and, you know, do what they need. Whereas here, you, you step outside of our, of our gate, there is crossroad, go down, crossroad, crossover, crossroad, full of crossroads everywhere. No one's here. It's dark. You hear the the howling and the and the barking of the dogs. You have the the light of the moon rustling through the leaves, and you leave your offering. And it that feels ancient. That feels um. I I literally feel like yes, I am doing uh, exactly the same thing that thousands of years ago another devotee of this same goddess in this same probably used this same crossroads and heard those same dogs barking and saw that these are things that. Okay, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a novelty. It's it's a decoration of the of the city, but it's something that you I didn't have in the city, because when I left my offering to the goddess, I had to leave it behind the plant pot, move the plant pot, so I know that it's not going to get. It, it's a different dimension for uh, living a, a religious life of a religion so intimately connected with the agricultural seasons and cycles, um, in the way that Rome that the Roman religion is. Living that today, as a city boy from London, in the it's southern Italian countryside, it is quite a special thing, I would say. And uh, the Romans actually did write a lot about agriculture. I'm wondering if there was some sort of, I don't know, either book or passage about agriculture from Roman times that you read that kind of like struck a chord with you? Um, gosh, uh... I mean, there is uh, Cato's uh, De Agricultura, I think. Yes, that's the one. Um, I mean, I haven't read it for hints and tips on how to grow better aubergines. But, um, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I use it to get the recipe for the Liber cake that we give on our sacrifice. And I followed his recipe, which was the, the pound of cheese and the one egg and the pound of flour. I don't know what eggs or flour he was using, but I've done his recipe. It doesn't work, Claudius. It doesn't work, all right? I had to cheat. I had to use mascarpone. I used a bit of this. And finally, I've got something that seemed decent. In, I don't know, because Aurelius Barbatus follows a similar recipe to Cato, and his look really nice, but... um. I guess it's not the same kind of cheese or something. I don't know. But um, about the agriculture and the use for food, um, I, I recently challenged Autronia Stolo to um, a gastronomic challenge for the month of February. I may have to delay it to March. But the, the idea was that we spend the month only eating Roman stuff because she also likes to cook and experiment with recipes. So I sent her a load of PDFs, a load of links to, uh, I think there's Historic Italian Cooking on YouTube. There's the Apicus book of ancient Roman recipes. And um, that's the challenge that we both spend breakfast, so ientaculum, lunch, prandium, and dinner, cena, only Roman dishes. Obviously, if you can't get hold of the specific ingredient, you can substitute it with something similar. But I want evidence that we're both suffering together because I've seen other people do this challenge and it doesn't always go well. Um, I, and I hope no. Sorry, I hope no door mice are involved. No, um, I've checked and door mice are still illegal for consumption in Italy, but um, I am willing to find an alternative. Rabbit, you can use rabbit. We've got lots of rabbits running around. Um, 
but I do think a trip to Croatia is worth it just for the draw mice, to be honest. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, so to go back a little bit, uh, you were mentioning all your stages of uh, going from London to the countryside. I'm wondering um, what was like the catalyst one for, for leaving London and two, um, going to Italy specifically to the countryside? Um, okay, I left London uh, on Wednesday, the 24th of September 2014. I think we left British airspace around half past seven in the morning. I arrived in Naples at nine at breakfast precisely. Uh, why did I do that? I was offered a job. Um, I am a language teacher. And during the summer holidays and occasionally the, the, the spring break, uh, our school hosted uh, foreign students, primarily Italians and Spanish kids. And there was a massive cohort of Neapolitans who came over every year. They were the big money clients. Um, and I spoke Italian. I also spoke, speak, but spoke then, the, um, the Neapolitan language, which none of the students expected. And when they found out that their teacher spoke their language better than they spoke his language, uh, they all went crazy. And they were telling their parents about it and uh, they phoned their school uh, about it. And the school asked, or one of the parents asked the group leader to offer me a job in Naples teaching some of the kids because they really took to my teaching. And honestly, I had ne never, never considered ever stepping foot in Naples. I had not heard anything particularly pleasant about it. And I was, I had been offered a job in Colombia. I had been offered a job in Mexico. And I had been offered a job, uh, I think, uh, in somewhere in Eastern Europe. And for some reason, I chose Naples. And I figured I'd recently uh, graduated with a first class honours degree in criminology and psychology. And the south of Italy is infamous for having developed five separate criminal uh, organisations of international proportions. And corruption is not unknown here in the south. So it was an opportunity to study, criminologically speaking, how did this happen? Uh, what is it about the South, their history, their culture, their traditions, the mentality, the very, very complicated and um, complex uh, history of Italy pre-Perry and post-unification? So, like, well, let's go and see what's happening in Naples. Um, and worst things, worst, they probably have good pizza. So I came and I stayed. And I was in the city of Naples right up until, um, to use the Princip Senatus's term, the plague arrived. It really cracks me up that she calls COVID the plague. It really messes me up. Um, uh, so when the plague hit, <laughs> uh, um, that's when I left Naples. So the, um, it hit February, the first lockdown was lifted in May. In June, I moved from the city into um, the city of the town of Portici, so it's just outside of Naples, but still an urban area. Um, and I was there for a year. And the, here in Italy, we had very strict lockdowns. It was it was really hard to keep up with. Uh, from one day to another, it was red zone, orange zone, yellow zone, white zone, but that street's a white zone, that street's an orange zone, so you can leave your house. You Nobody knew what was going on. Um, and so I thought, well, if I can't go anywhere and I can't do anything, why not not go anywhere and not do anything in the countryside because my partner's family have a home with a, a hectare and a half of land in the countryside and so that was the plan and i we transferred i think the first of may 2021 i moved in and i haven't left since and do you enjoy it I mean, obviously, it's much different than Naples or London. But I mean, after two, actually, more than two years, two and a half years, do you really enjoy your life there? Do you do you foresee that? I mean, I, I don't know about like the next forty years, but like the next five, ten years, do you foresee yourself living either there or in a rural setting? 
I mean, I'm not the type to suffer in silence, Decimus. If I wasn't happy, the world and his wife would know about it. Um, I've been here for three years and I'm, I have, there's too many things that we want to do to me to even consider what's going on in 40 years. Before the 40 years turns up, I've got temple to build, uh, apartments to do, goats to, to milk and stables and this. And I'm far too interested in all the projects that we've got going on. Um, my partner has a lot of projects about eco-sustainability and um, uh uh, automizing certain processes, biogas, and all there's a lot going on. Um, so I'm just going to say for the for the for the foreseeable future, I have no desire to go anywhere. Any whether or not I'm happy about it, I'm not going anywhere. I've started, <laughs> so bloody well finish is basically where we're at. Definitely. Now, um, one other thing that I know about you is that you actually have a talent for languages. Um, that's one thing I'm actually very jealous about. I mean, obviously, I could speak English. My German's okay. My Italian's pretty bad. And otherwise, we're just getting into a few sentences. But I mean, for you, I believe that I read that you could speak, um, what, seven or eight languages? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they're all fluent, but mo at least most of them, like, on a fluent level. I mean, the the... Total is uh, 12. Um, they're not all to the same level. Um, and they're not all to the same level that they used to be either. Um, I do try to keep uh, up with the different languages so I don't lose them completely. I write myself shopping lists uh, in that language. Uh, if I smack my elbow on the door frame, I try to swear in a, the, the language of the week. Uh, it's um, watching TV series in the original language. Um, I try to try to keep them all as present as possible. But that being said, the languages are in alphabetical order. Um, Arabic, Catalan, Creole, English, French, Greek, Hebrew, Italian. I'm going to include Latin, uh, Maltese, Portuguese, Neapolitan, Portuguese and Spanish. Wow, that, that's so impressive. But um, they, uh, thank you. Um, but they, like I said, they're not all to the same level, and not all of them were studied in um, in a in a formal context. I mean, I did Latin at school. Uh, I uh, frequented a traditionalist Catholic uh, parish where the mass was in Latin, uh, and my gr my mother's father was uh, an art teacher and uh, taught English to French students, and so spoke French. My father's family are from uh, Dominica and Guadeloupe, so we speak French, uh, French Creole and English. So there was a basis of things floating around and then from Latin at school and at church and then French at school, Spanish, uh, I had lots of Portuguese friends and Brazilian friends and uh, friends from Angola. I have family from Mozambique and all of these. So there were lots of different ways that I could attach to people who spoke a different language because I learned very early on that people who speak a different language have parents who cook food I haven't tried yet. And the better you speak their language, the more food they funnel down your mouth. So of course, that's what I did. I learned all of my languages so I could eat people's cooking. Um, and if I didn't oh. like your food, I wouldn't learn your language. And if I couldn't pronounce your language, I probably wouldn't eat your food. Um, and that's how it went for a long time. Um, but uh, growing up in central London uh, and going to a central and inner London uh, primary school and secondary school, we had children from every single nation on the planet. And so we would have international evenings and parties and I'd make friends and I'd go to celebrations. And because I'm the kid that eats, they'd invite, ah, oh, my mum really liked you. She wants you to come to this party, come to this. And so I would just go in here and pick up and, and learn. And I, one of my uh, tutory patron deities is um, Mercury. And in fact, I maybe not in the Roman sense, but in the Greek understanding, Hermes is the the god who taught languages to mortals. So I see it as learning languages, and in particular, trying to learn uh, obscure, strange language. Because I said I spoke Greek. 
but I actually speak Cypriot Greek, a particular dialect of Greek from Cyprus rather than standard Greek. I speak Arabic, but I speak Lebanese Arabic, a particular, so in Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan, so the Levantine style. I have no idea what the Moroccans are saying to me when they're banging on about something. I would speak to a Moroccan person in French rather than in, in Arabic. Uh, so the learning of little obscure dialects in some way keeps them alive. Even if nobody knows that I've learned to speak that language, I have. And that language is not going to die as quickly. Um, so that's what my passion for languages is. Uh, I, if I don't remember to speak the languages as I used to be able to, I really don't mind. The important thing is that I learned them, I tried, and that's going to continue in some way. Um, so regarding, so, because you also have a passion about uh, ancient, so Greece, um, do you, um, and you mentioned that you learned Cypriotic Greek. Um, can you at, at least read ancient Greek or um, did that not happen? No, I, I can, uh, do you mean, can I read it and understand it or can I read it and pronounce it and make it sound right? What are you asking me? Maybe a little bit of the first. Could you because like ancient I, Greek yeah. literature? Um, if uh, if it's a familiar text or it's a text talking about a familiar argument, yes, I can generally work my way clumsily through what I'm reading, um, but with a with lot less um, success than with Latin. I mean, I, I can look at a Latin text and basically know what's going on because of Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and my Latin studies and so on. Looking at an ancient Greek text, there we really are doing linguistic archeology span and opening dictionaries and declining and checking. And um, so I, like I said, I can speak it to a certain degree, in my devotions, in my prayers, I can do, but if I have to have spontaneous conversation with somebody else in ancient Greek, that's probably not going to happen. Not just yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, the time has um, passed so quickly, but I do have a, a few more questions, of course. Um, oh. Now, I know that you have a, so you mentioned earlier um, your interest in, um, I believe you said, criminology right yes yes uh, i'm wondering how you became interested in that and how did that lead to becoming in nova roma the triumvir capitalis uh interest in criminology and crime where was that born um one of the things that we do particularly well i mean uh in british television not taking anything from the giants of law and order and criminal minds and so on, is we do criminal uh, TV programs and police detective stuff really, really well. And I grew up uh, watching uh, things, uh, all the detective shows, all the police shows, and being fascinated not so much with um, the, the investigative process of the detectives, but more of the why why did that criminal choose to commit that crime? What did that crime mean? What was the motive? All the, um, and then, of course, I also enjoyed watching the, the adventure of the, of the police detectives investigating the crimes and looking for clues and, and understanding when someone's lying, sort of lie detection, so on. Um, and I, again, growing up in Central, I was very, I, very close to the different law courts, um, so I, I would often see uh, the beginning of the um, the ceremonial year, I forget of which, you would see all the different judges and justices in their wigs and their gowns and their chains processing along to the Royal Courts of Justice. And it was all very pompous and there was elegance and it was uh, the spectacle of justice. It was, it was very um, impressive for a young child. Um, and then just the concept of law and order and the how the concept of law changed and civilized men all of these things fascinated me and there are there's um a lot of the history of london is is the history of crime there are a number of uh, museums and random little exhibition things poked away uh connected to crime and punishment torture uh we were one of the first 
um, nations to have an independent police force in 18, 1820. Let's pretend it's 1820. 1820, we had the uh, Metropolitan Police riverboat uh, system before we had the actual police. Um, and then Scotland Yard and Sherlock Holmes and detectives and all of these. This is where the love for criminology came from. How did that translate into Nova Roma's Triumvir Capitalis? Well, the position of Triumvir Capitalis um, has only just been um, reinstituted, as far as I'm aware. I think I am myself and the other two Tresviri. We are the first Triumvir Capitalis of, of Nova Roma, and. When I saw that this position had been opened, um, the captain's general of the police force, a mix between uh, a chief superintendent and uh, a magistrate, uh, so investigating petty crime, criminal law, an understanding of the penal system. All of my, my dissertation at university was on the role of organized religion in the integration into the prison system and the rehabilitation into society after having left. So an intimate role between religion and the penal system and justice, that's that's my thing. And so, right, I'll have a bit of that. I quite fancy being a triumvir capitalis. And then I looked into what exactly the triumvir was, and we'll take uh, Christopher Furman's definition in policing the Roman Empire. And he says... Uh, a trio of minor magistrates, the Triumviri or Tresviri Capitales, were specialized police officials who administered Rome's jail and executions therein, supervised a modest nocturnal patrol, hence their alias Nocturni, and seemed to have exercised jurisdiction over minor crimes, arresting and dispensing summary justice to slaves and lower class citizens in the forum in and around the jail. What does that mean for Nova Roma? I'm the last person that steps in on a moderation on the Discord. I'm, uh, I settle disputes over good conduct on the various Novoroma forums, but I'm not the moderator who steps in straight away. We have our vigilis, uh, we have our various cohorts of the, the police officers or the moderators on the forums. I'm the person who has to set in and say, no, this has been decided. This is what happens from now on. Let it go. Or I kick you out or I silence you or I um, pass down summary judgment on inappropriate behavior. Uh, that's basically where we're at. It's the, I mean, if I don't know how that would translate into a, a reenactment situation, if we were to participate the Tresviri at uh, a Nova Roma event, and there was some kind of drunken brawl between two soldiers at the taverna, we would have to step in. But um, so far, it's just um, developing this whole moderation and dispute uh, uh, resolution and keeping public order and administration in our public forums. Very interesting. I mean, uh, you, you sent a picture of that book um, into the forum. I believe like a week ago. Yes. I'm, I'm sure there's so many different anecdotes. I mean, that, that's the beauty of ancient Rome is that it was, it's so raw, you know, mm -hmm. and there's so much just information that, uh, you know, you could spend hours and hours just reading these stories, <laughs> just kind of shaking your head, like wishing mm -hmm. that like maybe, maybe you could like look at the events, but not actually be there. Because I think exactly. uh, if we were there in ancient Rome, obviously it would be a very dangerous place for most of the people. Yes, definitely. But definitely a lot of fun from the sounds of things. That's true. Um, so just a couple quick questions because unfortunately we have to wrap up soon. Um, one of them is, um, I would just, curious what are some of your favorite um ancient either either roman or or non-roman but ancient archaeological sites in italy that you know you really enjoyed visiting um okay um pompeii is the obvious one that was a lot of fun um it's really easy to lose yourself and transcend time and space and imagine you're there Another um, particular favorite site is not so much a site as an exhibition now. It's the, the ISIS Museum 
uh, in Benevento, the of the temple that Emperor Domitian had built with um, Egyptian materials. In fact, it's the it was the largest temple to Isis outside of Egypt, built entirely with Egyptian uh, materials. And there are some cracking uh, things there. And you can't really appreciate the size of the temple based on the very small exhibition. But then when you walk around the city and you sort of get a layout in your mind, okay, we know that this bit was right by um, Traiano's uh, arch. We know that that bit was near that church. Or there. So you start to get a feel that this was a massive thing. And uh, there's a couple of the columns still present standing inside a church. Or if you go into a baker's shop and go down a couple of steps, you can see through a window another aspect. It's, I think that's why I like the, the, the lack of, of the archaeological site in Benevento because you walk around and see so much of modern life that could have been contained in this temple complex that that for me was impressive. Um, obviously Rome's nice, it's nice to walk around in every single aspect of every street, you know, you turn a corner and you've got something thousands of years old opposite a pizza guy and a little girl and her smart, it's, it's, but Rome, I have to admit, unpopular opinion, is not my favorite city. Um, I love Rome to visit, but I could yes. never live there. There's a big difference yeah. between visiting and living. Yes, that's for sure. Um, but I, so I don't some a, a, a pastum here in the south is beautiful. Uh, there are there are a lot there are a fair few things going on uh, the city of naples you know you walk around and you've got in the city center the ancient greek walls the um, the decumani and you've got the, the temple view and you've got this i think the city of naples is my favorite archaeological um place the city itself cuz there's just so much greek roman etruscan <laughs> sabine everything all all the, and some of it they haven't even had to uh, renovate. It's just there. It hasn't changed in centuries, and you can you can touch it. It's nice. Have you been to Kume? I mean, that's not too far, and that yes. also has a, a Greek. Um, I, I, th yes, I think I it was founded by Greek settlers, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Kume was the original Greek set uh, settlement here. Yeah, I've been to Kuma a number of times. Mm -hmm. They have the Grotto of the, uh, the Sibylla. They have uh, the Lake, the Lago Averno, which for the Greeks was the entrance to the, the underworld. Uh, in fact, here in Magna Grecia, point of interest, uh, Proserpina, the Roman Persephone, is known as Proserpina Averne, Proserpina of Averna. Proserpina was mixed with Libera, so I am responsible for her cult as the Prince of Liber. And in my exam, I used the epithet uh, of Proserpina Averne with Libera. And Cornelius Lentz said, why are you using Juno's epithet for Libera? I said, oh, my bad. Because here in the south, Proserpina had that um, epithet connected to Kuma and Averne because of the Greek connection of those cults as they went north to Rome. I mean, it's, it's such a fascinating place. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been to Campania, maybe 12 times or more. And I've actually been to the museum that you mentioned in Bene Benevento about 10 years ago. The only thing though is when I was there, everything was in Italian. So, I mean, I, I could understand the objects, but I couldn't really piece the, you know, piece them all together. No, they've, they've added but, a I mean, translation now. That's, that's awesome. Now, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, some time ago, uh, you posted a picture where you had some finger symbols, and I think it was a sort, certain festival. And uh, yes, can, can you briefly describe them and um, yes. for which festival you, you use it for? Yes. Okay. These uh, will, be, will be known to most people from the singer to the flamenco castanets of Spain. Now, in Italian, they're called nacchere, but in Neapolitan, they're called castagnette, like the Spanish word. Um, these are used in a number of southern Italian dances, uh, traditional dances of uh, Magna Grecia, in particular for uh, the Naples area and uh, just up to where I live here is one of the dances called um, the tamburiata. And the dance is um, 
goes back to the traditional uh, agricultural traditions of the cults of Demetra and Dionysia, so Ceres and Liber, um, because a lot of the movements in one of the particular styles is connected to the gathering of the harvest, picking the fruit from the trees, carrying the baskets, moving around the fields and fertility and growing and um, blah, blah, blah. Another of the traditional types is a sort of a, a courtship amongst the groves, amongst the trees, uh, very Bacchic in its sense. Uh, the movements of the feet are moving the soil to throw down the seeds. It's all very agricultural. And the my ribbons are all one color. They're all red. But they're supposed to be um, a mix of contrasting colors because they act as an apotropaic uh, feature, keeping away uh, the bad stuff, the bad spirits, negativity. The sound of the nakare, the colors of the ribbons, this is all apotropaikos, as, we, as they say in Greek. Um, and the dance is tamuriata and is connected to this drum, which is called the tambura. Now, the drum itself, um, if it's going to be strictly technically a tambura, needs to have been crafted in the shadow of Vesuvius. So anywhere outside of that, the, um, the villages around the mountain, it's not technically a tambura, it's just a basic drum. And it's made with goat skin. Um, and uh, there are a particular number of symbols and timpani which are connected to the goddess uh, Magna Mater. Chibele, the mother of the gods, because legend has it that it was her priests, the the galloi, uh, the um, cross-dressing, gender-bending, emasculate, no, emasculated, um, castrated, castrated priests of Chibele, um, and they would, um, and they are supposed to have invented this drum for her rites and her dances and her um, ceremonies around the fires by torchlight, which were also connected to the rituals of Bacchus. And um, in fact, there is a festival on the 2nd of February, which for the Christian calendar is the Candelora, um, where there is, a there is a temple, a church on a mountain in a place called Avellino, which is another member of um, the Samnite confederacy. And on this mountain, uh, Monte, which is near the town of Mercoliano, at the top, Virgil um, talks to us of the temple of the mother of the gods, where her priests would um, do their crazy rituals and their, their ecstasy and the frenetic dancing and the drinking and the blood and all kinds of things. Um, and it was on this mountain. And then the temple was supposedly destroyed, but the foundations remained. And a local bishop, uh, trying to make a name for himself, built a Christian sanctuary on top of the temple, after a, um, a vision of the Virgin Mary, who, who told him to do it. And then years, years, years went by, and we're now in the 1300s, and there was a young couple from a local village, two young, two young men, who were um, kicked out of the village for unchristian behavior, let's say, and they were tied to a tree and left naked to freeze uh, during the cold, harsh winter. And there was something about a voice from the mountain, from the church, uh, um, caused an avalanche to fall and cover the boys in this sort of vacuum where they survived and didn't die. And the next day, when the, the, the villagers asked the priest, why did this happen? He said, because they were clearly uh, the kind of boys that would have become priests of the goddess. And that's her mountain. So she's protecting them. And from that point onwards, every candelora, there is what they call aiute femminelle, which is the, the going up of the effeminates, which where homosexuals, transsexuals, cross-dressers, uh, the, the whole plethora of LGBTQ, XYZ, and all the rest of it, take part, um, and they go up this mountain singing and dancing with the, with the drums and the castanets, much like the priests of Cibele would have done, up the mountain to the sanctuary, uh, they go into the sanctuary and there is um, a number of people who, who play the drum, who are all in a circle, and they do a, a call and response to the statue and the icon of the Virgin Mary, Mama Schiavona, using her epithets as Civelis and Magna Mater. 
they have an effeminate man dressed in uh, the turban with the purple and the yellow of the Galloi priests with jewelry who does a very um, evocative invocation to the goddess. They salute it with the drums and then you drink and you dance exactly as the way you would have done thousands of years with the Galloi. And that's where I'm going next week. Well, I hope you have a, a wonderful time. Now, um, I, I do um, want to just put in, uh, just make one more question because I actually forgot to ask you at the top. Um, that would have been a great note to end the uh, interview, but I actually forgot to ask how you found out about Nova Roma and how you came up with uh, your name. Um, okay. And those are going to um, be the last questions of the interview because unfortunately we've uh, run out of time. Uh, the the name is is the easiest answer. Um, so the name that I, I I have adopted for my Roman identity is Lucius Delius Liberalis. Um, the Nova Roma website provides lots of information on how to choose and how to create your name. And they, they mentioned that, you know, if you can try to Latinize your surname for your nomina. Now, my mother's uh, family name is Daly. Um, and Daly, according to calculations and algorithms known only to Cornelius Lentulus, will probably have been Latinized as Delius. Was the gens Deli a real thing? Yes, it was completely acceptable. Uh, liberalis, why? Because I am a devotee of Liber, and Liberalis, as identified by the Grand Dame Hortensia Faustina, was a, co uh, a cognomina used by priests of Liber, two out of three. As for the, the prenomina Lucius, I just really like the sound of it. Lucius Delius Liberalis, that's the name I can get behind. Very nice. How did I come to and find out about Nova Roma? Uh, it was, again, um, a, a recurring theme. Hortensia Faustina is a member of uh, Hellenion, a Greek Hellenic polytheist um, organization. And uh, we are both uh, members of that organization. And she mentioned it to me in passing. And I remember about 10 years ago, I had first come across Nova Roma and I started to put in my details and choose my name. And there was a problem with the with the database. It said error message, error message. I thought, well, do you know what? I've seen error message too many times this afternoon. I can't be bothered. And it just disappeared. And then five years later, Hortensia was like, well, you know, you should join Nova Roma. We're a great bunch. I was like, well, I'll have a check. And the rest is history. Recent history. Wow, I history. mean... That's such a shame that it didn't work because, you know, who knows what would happened if, you know, it did and you would have been uh, a member of Nova Roma much earlier. But I mean, we're, I can't speak with for others, but I'm very glad that, you know, you've definitely uh, joined. I mean, uh, you've been a part of Nova Roma for, I believe, a few years now. I, and, think it's um, two, I think it's three years. I'm coming up to starting my third year. And so in three years, I've gone from nothing to being triumvir capitalis, Sacerdos Liberi, I was the first tribunus tribus of tribus lucerensis. I was the curio curie of curio quetulane that I had to resign from to become triumvir capitalis. But I am slowly, slowly making my, making my mark on my little corner of Nova Roma. But uh, my ambitions are not so grand. I'm more than prepared to remain a provincial priest and a summary judge for petty crime. <laughs> well, I definitely am a huge fan of uh, seeing what you're doing on the farm and what you're doing with festivals and uh, definitely uh, really appreciate your contribution to Nova Thanks, Roma. Man. And on that note, um, I do have to say thank you so much for being a part of this interview. And um, we're definitely going to have it posted to YouTube soon. So I hope the people at home enjoy as well. And uh, with that, I um, hope you have a good evening. And uh, I have to say vale. <laughs> vale. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.